things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord and His gracious to read all His precious words. In chapter number one, now we saw <coughs> what we could label the philosophy of a Christian living. Here in chapter number two, we'll see the pattern for Christian living. There is a pattern that God has, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, He was the forerunner. Uh, he went ahead of us. Uh, he uh, put out the pattern of the way that we should live. And that uh, we should have, uh, strive to have the mind of Christ, to think on the spiritual things. I found that they didn't like this. Uh, with the carnal things and the worldly things that bog me down and bog my mind down, uh, sometimes I just turn on some good gospel music and listen to it. And um, uh, that uh, starts to uh, soothe my soul. And then the wonderful Word of God, uh, when we can set a portion of time aside uh, to get in the God's Word uh, and uh, let the Lord minister to our own. He will fulfill those things. And uh, here in chapter number two, we're going to see a pattern of Christian living. And that pattern of Christian living is the mind of Christ. Now, this is what's so exciting me about this type of scripture. This chapter is one of the greatest theological statements in scripture concerning Christ. In all of Scripture, this is one of the great uh, theological statements concerning Christ. And we'll get to that day on around verse 5, 6 and 7. Now, <coughs> through the years, this has been one of the most controversial issues. And um, uh, no doubt, in the, back over there in Europe and probably the Middle Ages, it's what probably divided Europe straight down the middle. Uh, was uh, this theological issue, this theory that um, it's, it's known as the Teneo, Teneo, that's the Greek word, the Teneo theory. And, and this is it. It says that Christ's incarnation that he, that they say that he emptied himself of the deity. That's what the Bible do. They say with Christ's incarnation. He lost the deity. But the scripture does not teach that. Christ never lost the deity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was always God. And uh, so Jesus was, he was always deity. 100% God and 100% man. When Jesus was a little baby born in a man, he was God incarnate. He was the God man. Uh, as a little baby, he could have stood up the outside of this world if he wanted to. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this theory came about that he Christ's incarnation he entered himself as a deity. This chapter will make it abundantly clear Christ did not enter himself of his deity. This is my fault. I think it's preposterous. Total ignorance of scripture, absence of spiritual discernment uh, for, for that theory to yeah, be out there. First, we're going to begin though with verse number one. And uh, he starts out with the word if. Oh, now we know that if is a uh, conditional clause. I always think about the word if, um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called the line shall humble themselves and pray. Uh, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, he's not using the if as a conditional clause. He's using it for a question. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, his uh, style, the Apostle Paul, and uses it as an argument rather than a condition. And the Apostle Paul, we know, was a logical thing. And uh, so, uh, 
he was, uh, he said, if there be any consolation in Christ, that word consolation means comfort, follow that which affords comfort or refreshment. No. He said, if there be any consolation in Christ, I tell you the time. Glory to God, there is a comfort in Jesus Christ. There is a solace in the Lord. And that Jesus Christ is that which affords the refreshment for our souls. Mm -hmm. Amen. Glory to God. He is the one that affords us the comfort and the spiritual necessities that we need. I, I would hate to try to go through this life without Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know how folks make it without the Lord. Honestly, He the comfort. There be any consolation in Christ. If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any battle of mercy, he says, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Now, I just think we label verse 2 through 4 as the communion that we have with the Lord. Uh, he says, fulfill ye my joy. The aged apostle Paul says, you know, he said, Philippi, the first Philippi, you know what brings him joy. Fulfill ye my joy. Therefore, he said, do these things that are Christ-like. If you want to fulfill my joy, do the things that are Christ-like. The church of Philippi was in that Roman providence, I believe probably, uh, Brother Jeff, it was probably a, a, just a week in time back then as it is today. There was all kinds of perverseness and perversion going on. But God, you know, he told us in his word, you're in this world, but you're not all this world. You're citizens of another country. You're just pilgrims and strangers. You're just passing through this land. Oh, there'll be temptations and trials and troubles that come. Uh, but be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. That ungodly bunch, they're not going to win. Jesus has already won the victory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We're on the winning side tonight. Oh, we have this consolation in Christ. And the Apostle Paul says, Fulfill ye my joy, be ye like mine. <coughs> having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Be on the same page. He said, be like-minded, be on the same page, having the same love, love one another. Wasn't that what Jesus said? He said, love one another. Mm -hmm. If you love me, love one another. <coughs> one of the uh, evidences of salvation mm -hmm. we read it over in uh, uh, I believe uh, one of the books of uh, Middle John, first second or third John. He said that you love the bread. That you love the bread. How do you know you find you got on the line? You love the bread. Same way. Same way. Love one another. Verse number three, like nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Now here we go. But in loneliness of mine, but it can see other better than this. He says, no strife, no injury, no rain <coughs> holy, no uh, and no troublemaking, no vain glory, we know what that is. But in lowliness of mind. And uh, that solves the problem. It's humbleness. It's being humble before. Jesus humbled himself. And uh, I believe the Apostle Paul humbled himself. And uh, sometimes it's hard to be humble. But that old way. Uh, I wish I'd never heard it. That old thing. <coughs> it's just so hard to be humble. And, and, uh, and uh, but uh, we've got to be humble before the Lord. Loneliness. Of mine. Look not, verse number four, every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of us. Now, others is the key to this fact. <coughs> Why did Christ come to earth and die on the cross? He came for others. He didn't just 
just don't do that for yourself. He came for us. Why spread the gospel of Jesus Christ is for others? Why come out here every Sunday and have church for others? Fulfill the love of Christ is for others. Hallelujah. For that communion that we have with the Lord. <clears throat> Brother McGuire, he said, Look at mine. He knew which was all so in Christ Jesus. Oh, the mind of Christ. Let me come to the feast. Real quick. Chapter number four. If I can find it. Please. Chapter number four. I know you're going the wrong way. Please. Chapter number four. Verse number one and two. I don't have to look through the four, but they see that you walk through the association when you are called. With all lowness and made long suffering, will bury one another. Amen. And now we come to this great theological statement, the great, one of the greatest in all scripture. Some consider it the greatest doctrinal statement in all the New Testament relative to the person of Christ. Uh, it, uh, it was known as the um, I have this word. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. The empty is what it means. It's Greek word. The passion will make it clear he did not empty himself of deity. It will give as the seven steps. You want to see the seven steps of Christ humiliation. We will find here seven steps. The, the seven steps, and I'm not saying this through all the beliefs, the seven steps downward from Christ from heaven to earth. The seven steps downward of Christ's humiliation. <coughs> and then on in this chapter, next week and I will really you'll see the seven steps up of Christ's humiliation. <coughs> So, then, humiliation, we see the mind of Christ. So, number one of these seven steps. Uh, the first step, down there, was that he left heaven's glory and came to earth. That's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. He had the glory. He was with the Father. He left that glory of us. He left that land of us. I can imagine Jesus. Son of God, sitting on the right hand of God, stepping over the banisters of glory, coming down to this thing, cursed world for others, mm. to save us all. Oh, that was his first step. And in verse number six, he asserts his deity to being in the form of God, body not robbery, to be equal with God. He asserts his deity. He did not lose his position in heaven when he left heaven and came to this earth for 33 years. Jesus Christ did not lose his position. He was still the Son of God. Hallelujah. He was still deity. He was still the God man. So he left heaven glory and came to earth. Number two, and verse number seven, but made himself of no deputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of me. He made himself of no reputation, simply means to empty. The Greek word, that Greek word, tenaia, he emptied himself. Not of anything, but rather he emptied himself by taking the form of a human. He made himself with no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. To the point of death for our good and salvation. Beginning here in verse number five, Paul sets forth Christ as the consummate example, the very kind of selfishness 
in which he exalts believers and himself exemplifies. That's what Jesus did. He made himself a no education. Number three, the third step. He took the father in the form of a servant. Now, remember Jesus. He didn't come to earth in a house. He didn't come down here living the life of righteousness. Living, uh, having fame and fortune and money. He lives in a peasant home in Nazareth. He was a carpenter. <coughs> he built things with his hands. He helped go. And they built things. That's what Jesus did. He was a working man. The poor, low class of society. Isaiah wrote that Christ would come as, and, and, and this is interesting, how did Isaiah uh, word it in chapter 11 and verse number 10 of Isaiah? As the root of Jesse. He didn't say the root of David. He said the root of Jesse. Jesse was just a farmer. Although Jesus was of the house and went to David, <laughs> and Isaiah said he comes from the root of Jesse, the peasant farmer. Christ was born to a peasant farmer, the peasant farmer himself. Because the line had gone back to that state. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation. He came down from heaven and glory. Fourthly, fourthly, the fourth step of Christ's humiliation, he was made in the likeness of man. Made in the likeness of man. Now, one preacher said it like this. He said, he got some ice in his he was trying to kill life. But um, he said, what if I could take on the form of a hand and go down to be in that low and, um, and he just went on to explain that. And I thought, that's what, you know, that's what Jesus did. <coughs> He was so much that he came down here to be with us, to, to save us. That's humiliation. That's the full step of Christ's humiliation made in the likeness of man. He was gone. He was created. The fifth step. Verse number eight. And being found in the fashion as a man, notice this, he humbled himself. Now, you might have heard of the old time preacher, John Wesley. Years, uh, maybe early 1800s, maybe 1700s. I, I can't remember. John Wesley. He was a great, great preacher. Uh, talking of humiliation talking of being humble. John Wesley was going across the creek and he got to the football. And he started to cross, started to jump on the football. And um, one of the uh, liberal preachers of the day came along on the other side and started to cross the football. And the liberal preacher said, he just kept on walking. He said, uh, I don't give way to a fool. And uh, John Wesley, he stepped off the wall and let the preacher go by. And he said, I always do. <laughs> I always do give way to the fool. He said, he, he walked, he stepped back. He humbled himself. He let that man go by. So, and Jesus, oh, 
be found in the fashion as a man humbled himself. Humble himself. The sixth step of Christ's humiliation. He became obedient unto death. Death is the ultimate humiliation. Think about how Jesus died. Mm-hmm. The, the ultimate humiliation. They humiliated Jesus. All from from the very beginning. And I tell you, from the time he was born, Brother Gerald, he was humiliated. Uh, they called him uh, they called him names. You're born out of wedlock. You're you're trash. You're poor. You're nothing. And then he grew up. Oh, and then he was lied upon. Then he was sold for thirty pieces of silver, the price of a slave. They took him, they slapped him, they blindfolded him, they plucked out his beard. They humiliated him. They beat him. They whipped him. They, they stood him out there in front of that crowd. And then they hung him on that cross. Oh. He became obedient. Death is the ultimate humiliation. Mankind was not born or not created to die. Death entered this world through sin. The wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve sin. The sin curse in Death is. So Jesus was born to die. Hallelujah. He was born to die. He came to die. And he became obedient unto death. The rest of made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. He made himself in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death. And he fell up in life still. In the humiliation of Christ. Verse number eight, even the death of the cross. No. The end of the verse, even the death of the cross. Christ came from the highest possible point.